you know, risk is scary. It can be scary. You want to take on, for instance, as little guarantees and recourse as you can if you are borrowing money. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and today I will be speaking with Evan Watts, one of the founding partners of D&A Companies. Evan and his team at DNA are a group of real estate, architecture and construction professionals who believe in the importance of alluring, inspiring and special places. They leverage their expertise and passion to deliver valuable projects for their partners, clients and communities through the art of design and the business of real estate development. Prior to DNA, Evan spent almost seven years as part of the development team at Tamark Co and two years of those as Director of Development, overseeing development, marketing, and sales. Evan is a native of Atlanta with a deep family ties to both Atlanta and Birmingham. He is a graduate of the Georgia Institute of Technology and Columbia University, earning both a Master of Science in Real Estate Development and a Master of Architecture. He is a licensed architect and a real estate salesperson. In this episode, Evan and I discuss the importance of knowing the language of other disciplines. Here we talk about understanding financial literacy and the complexities and strategies that developers go through in order to raise capital for projects. We also talk about having an appetite and a tolerance for risk. So this is a really exciting conversation. Uh, As many of you know, we at Business of Architecture love talking to architect developers. It's one of our favorite conversations to have. And um, Evan and the team at DNA are doing an extraordinary job. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Evan Watts. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Evan, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Good, Ryan. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. So very excited to be speaking with you. You are the co-founder and partner of DNA. Yes. Um, you guys are multidisciplinary. You're kind of straddling the world of real estate, architecture, and construction. You've had a very interesting career. I know you've been a teaching assistant at Columbia, which is where you trained. You've worked as an architect and as a designer in a number of different practices across the across the city. And DNA has been going for how long? Since 2018? So just so pre-COVID. That's right. Right before COVID, we formed... In 2018, my partner Kartik and I founded the company, and we quickly, about a year later, onboarded our third partner, JJ McCormick, to the team. Great. And so what was the, the impetus then to start the company, and how come you've, you've gone for this kind of, kind of broad suite of activities rather than just you know, your traditional architecture practice or a traditional contracting practice? Yeah. You know, we... Myself, my background is actually both in architecture. I've trained as an architecture, as an architect. I've gone to school for architecture, but I also later ended up getting a dual degree, a dual master's in real estate development. So when I was leaving school, leaving Columbia in early 2010 or 2011, I was really looking around for a practice that reflected um, not just a discipline of architecture, but looking more broadly at development and the ownership side of, of real estate and project building. Uh, I think one of the main reasons, one of the core objectives I was seeking was a company at that time that could provide its own design services and have a lot of the control and decision making that an owner may. Mm-hmm. And I was fortunate to be linked up to Kartik Desai, one of the members of that former firm called Tamark and Company at the time. And we, um, we were a small group. We were New York City based. We, um, we were fortunate that Kerry to market at the time was somewhat of a trailblazer in the space of both architecture and development. Today, it's a bit more commonplace, I think, to find in the States that kind of hybrid approach. 
But at that time, and in the 90s, when he first formed his company, it was a very rare thing to find. Um, and I just found myself really loving being in that space where we could design, develop, finance projects, um, analyze projects, and uh, really be focused on quality architecture. Mm -hmm. well, it's, it's a very unique experience as well for someone with a, a design background to actually start to view and really enjoy seeing architecture as not just a place and a space for people, but also you know, its use as a financial instrument. Right. Which is some, sometimes this is a big piece that's missing from our architectural education. And you know, my, my personal opinion is, is because it's missing from our architectural education, we end, up, end up, we end up kind of being adversarial with it. And it doesn't need mm -hmm. to be like that. Absolutely. I mean, it's funny. I was remarking about even the programs of architecture and the different programs that schools of architecture teach beyond mm -hmm. the discipline of just architecture itself. And you know, I was thinking about GSAP, the school we went to at Columbia, the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, which is a phenomenal school and has great programs outside of just architecture, including real estate development. And just remarking that those programs for such long periods of our education always operated in silos and vacuums. Yes. The crossover between these two disciplines or many disciplines seem to... Um, some somewhat of friction. It was it was difficult to establish this relationship between you know the architects and the development courses. Um, and so you're right. I think that fundamentally the way we're trained as architects uh, historically has been limiting how much additional exposure uh, of these other programs, these other disciplines that we interface with so often in the actual practice in the professional mm -hmm. world. I think that's changing, which is great. It's great to see that. Um, even in our, my own program at Columbia, it's certainly changed. And I think increasingly you're finding these more hybrid types of educations um, taking place. Yeah. It, it's also fascinating the fact that, you know, we as architects, trained architects, are historically, uh, you know, the Renaissance man, so to speak, right? We, we know a little bit about everything. You know, from from more social skills to community skills to legal to the ability to relate to art and to science and to math. I mean, it's, it's fascinating how many things that we have to um, to juggle mm -hmm. as a profession, and it re does truly require you to um, develop a very broad skill set on its own. Um, it's it's a perfect petri dish to add a bit more of that risk add a bit more of that um, responsibility, which would be looking outside just the confines of the, of architecture that we've, we've created historically. In yeah. the well, well, it's so interesting as well. You know, we're starting to see more and more architects, you know, starting to wear the hat of developers. And this can be a, a, a terrifying thing for many architects. And we've got, you know, practices like yourself, Alloy, Jonathan Siegel in the US, here in the UK, we've got Roger Solosevich. And this is it's becoming, you know, we're so well poised to be more propositional, if you like, as an architect. But there are these missing skills that the developer has that perhaps the architects, we don't understand. What, from your perspective, what have what are some of those skills and what have been some of the challenges that that you guys have have faced and overcome in creating a business that does both it's a great question i think um i think a lot of it is having a growing appreciation for for onboarding risk and realizing the return that that it can come with um we have to be careful about how much risk we take on because we both have professional liability risk as an architect. Yeah. Um, and if we seek to add more risk, then it actually needs to come with a lot of reward. I think part of that too is how we are, um, how we're trained, how we're educated. Uh, we could probably benefit, even if we don't enter the space of development or real estate, we would probably as a practice in general benefit from learning underwriting skills, for instance, how to model um, uh, and budgeting skills and ways of looking at more broad-based understandings of a development project, financing, how that works, um, and different instruments of financing, 
how to raise equity or how projects are put together from the capital SAP perspective. A lot of that can be just taught to architects, even if we don't wish to onboard the risk itself or the role itself. Because what I think it does, I think what it ends up setting up is a dynamic and a relationship with an owner or a developer or an owner's rep um, that almost alleviates or um, elevates you to a playing field that speaks their language. I think it's, mm -hmm. it's easy to say that, um, but there are sometimes the developer's architect, that term that's being used um, for certain firms who can really cater to, to an owner, to a developer. Often those firms kind of sacrifice good design in the process, sacrifice what it is to, to create capital architecture. So I think the real fine balance is establishing, knowing what that is, knowing what that means, and so being able um, to understand the budget at every design phase so that you can maintain those core principles of a project, for instance. And so that at the end of the day, a project not be eat to death that we all know and, and, and totally lament happens because it does when we go into the design phase and initial initially and not fully appreciate the other constraints that maybe the developer is worried about or foreseeing or projecting down the road in 18 months. Yeah. But again, that's, that's very interesting. You know, to the, the more fluency that architects have, you know, they don't need to be the ones necessarily taking the risk, but if they if they're fluent in the in the language of the developer and understand the kind of challenges that the developer faces in terms of raising capital and the risks that they're taking, this allows us to be able to, you know, structure our, our offer or fees or services in a way that caters to that and that makes us much more competitive in the marketplace and ultimately from an architecture perspective you know you'll be able to realize more design work or realize more higher level of fees because absolutely i think i think what you just said is so integral because i think we pause there for a moment it's one of the reasons why um historically and fundamentally we're not able to garner the fees that we know we, are, we deserve yeah as an architecture practice i think fundamentally Design takes time. It's iterative. We know these things in the practice. It's a very hard thing to quantify. But if you're able to um, immediately put yourself in a playing field that truly um, earns the respect and appreciation of the developer, they're more likely to compensate you when you say, look, I'm, I'm interested in pursuing this. I'm happy to test out all these feasibility studies and analyses and and even iterate in that process. But I think that we need to do so, so I can keep the lights on. And, and actually more than just that, you need to do so, so that you can make money. And I know that's a non-popular um, sentiment in architecture because we're artists as well. But, you know, it's, it's a paradigm that I don't think you can separate. I think that you have to be able to make money. It's, a, it's an endeavor, it's a profession, it's, it's something that you should actually not just keep the lights on with, but not feel ashamed of making profit because mm -hmm. the truth of the matter is everyone else in the building process and everyone else is making money. Yeah. The lender is making money. The contractor we know is making a lot of money. Often the developer makes good money. They can, but they have a, a lot of, of risk. And when they make mm -hmm. good money, they can make really good money. But sometimes that's also a challenge. They, sometimes they don't. And all the other consultants that we know we interface with um, tend to turn a pretty good profit. Who is the one, who is the group who has probably the lowest margin? And it's likely the architects in the equation, which is, which is just absolutely astonishing just by thinking of how much of a hand the architect does have mm -hmm. in the identity creating, in the space creating, in the, the construction document creating, which is a legal construct, how much of a hand the architect does have and how little reward they often receive. It's, it's something that I know is a great source of frustration for a lot of my peers who are yeah, immensely talented. Yeah, across across the globe, we have we have this kind of this heartache, basically this heartache of the of the low fees. So in in uh, at DNA, then, how do you guys structure relationships 
with in projects do you take a project and you do the architecture you do the development and you do the construction is it all kind of a one-stop shop or do you sometimes do architectural services for other developers or do you sometimes do the development and work with other architects how does it typically work and it, it, how do you, you start you, like that? you laid out a great a great variety of scenarios that um, all of which at some some point are at play and, and can and have happened um, generally speaking, we, um, we are the developer, the, the master developer, so to speak. Um, we partner with a lot of local partners in different markets that we are um, involved in, which I think is actually, uh, and we can come back to later, but a fundamental and a very strong aspect of our business plan, I think, that allows you to have greater breadth. Um, yep. But that, those partnerships coupled with um, providing ourselves, if we can, a design architectural service where we will do design services for core and shell and other layouts and do the things that we know are very strong um, in doing, but almost always onboard an architect of record, um, another architect shop, especially if we're in another market in which we're not necessarily headquartered in, which is outside of New York City. Um, so we are comfortable doing those services for ourselves. In the past, we have partnered with other developers in which we do a fee development service and a fee architecture service without as, taking as much of the upside on a particular deal. Maybe we won't invest as much capital. Um, but it really does, it does run the full gambit. We, we occasionally will, will do strictly design work and architecture work for clients or family members or friends we tend to find those projects as more um, pet projects or projects in which we get to exercise our design muscle and not need to be as concerned about the financing, um, need to be as concerned about the equity and the capital stacks. But those are, are, are more limited. Um, and we, we've lately focused on uh, starting our own projects off the ground and adaptive reuse in um, the New York region, not as much as uh, as we used to in the New York City market. The, we're active in New York State, upper uh, lower Hudson Valley, rather, as well as down south. Right. In currently in Birmingham, Alabama, and and looking at some deals, some really cool deals in Michigan. And all of these projects, I think, require a certain degree of strategic partnerships that um, allow us to operate these spaces and. Um, really get our, our hands wet with some really fun fun projects to work on. So how, how did it start? How did you kind of begin? Did you take it as like we, we had like an architecture project or was there a site that you decided that you wanted to develop or were you raising capital at the very start? What was the kind of the seeds that led you to be able to do what it is that you're doing now? Well, we were fortunate that we were able to have some legacy projects from um, when we founded the company in 2018. We had some legacy projects in the New York City area, a really phenomenal condo project on the Upper West Side of Manhattan that we finished for Tamark and Company. Um, and we there both provided development and management services, but also some design services. Uh, and we were at the tail end of that project, wrapping it up just before COVID, really, where we started to um, raise capital and partner with some family friends of ours down south on the project in Birmingham, which is an office building, believe it or not, uh, adaptive reuse of an old office building that we converted into a really cool Class A new office space in a market that is pretty saturated with office, but have done quite well. Um, mm -hmm. Despite that, and I think we can talk more, but design is a testament to, to be able to distinguish yourself from other, other products in the market. But it, I think what we found ourselves having the skills at the time to, to do what you just said, raise capital, develop relationships with lenders, and just jump right in. I mean, I think that when you question and, and think about, well, where do I start as an entrepreneur or um, an architect who's wanting to enter a more of a, a of an ownership space. Where do you begin? And I think I think it starts with some of the fun, uh, appreciating the fundamentals that we already we know deeply, which is location, um, 
the idea of which asset type could be the highest and best use for uh, a particular lot or an old building that you might see walking down the street every day or that yeah. you might pass and be like, I wonder what's happening there. And just have that itch, inquire and figure out, well, what could I make of it? And I think that we, we envision these things quite well as architects. And I think it's, it's merely taking it one step further in which you have to question, oh, how do I achieve, you know, a goal. And, and I think that for us as a team, while we've all had tremendous experience um, in New York City and other markets, we looked at our first project in Birmingham, the office building. We, we, we looked at it um, as a way of starting small and knowing let's concentrate on a way to really be successful in this redevelopment of a, of a 55,000 square foot office building and focus on on turning it into a really great business plan and yeah. highlighting great design in the process. And I think what that has done for us in the, in the years since is really allowed us to pursue bigger and even more attractive and exciting projects. Um, and I think so I would, one thing I would, I would really just want to resonate on is um, start small and, and really allow yourself to have the latitude of having some good success and build mm -hmm. upon that. And, and really see where it can take you. So how is the the actual company itself structured? Is it, you know, um, a separate legal entity, say, for example, for the architecture department and the, the development department, or is it actually all under one roof, under under one same company? How did that, and how do they all interact with each other? Well, DNA Companies is an umbrella company. Right. Uh, but it, it does operate just how you were describing the the architecture arm has its own LLC that allows actually PLLC that allows us to operate with a license. Um, however, currently we're not um, in the business of stamping our own drawings, but we could. Uh, right. The development arm, ha we have a, an equity side, which is concentrated on raising capital. Um, and we have a project management arm that is doing what you would imagine, which is providing a service to our developments on the project management side. And wow. we are, as I mentioned, there's three partners. There's myself, Kartik Desai, and J.J. McCormick. Um, Kartik and I, our backgrounds are in development and architecture. And we were fortunate that J.J., as a trained engineer, but also having had many years of, of uh, project management on the executive level of, of large construction shop here in New York City, he brings just a, a wealth of knowledge on the construction management side. So we are able to look at the way we tackle our projects from both the underwriting and design perspective, but we can, we can manage the construction, which I think is a really integral part to um, our business plan. If you look at it like a Venn diagram, we're, we all overlap a lot in the things that we do. Um, and we like that that structure allows us to have blurred lines between each, each of our responsibilities. But I think it's integral that um, we have structured ourselves in such a way that we can manage the construction in-house and and look at um, be almost operating like our own owner's rep, constantly able to to review and analyze the construction recs that we receive from the GCs and making sure as a, as a project manager, we have fiduciary responsibility to our investors that the project is running smoothly and so is the construction. Yeah. One of the things that often becomes the biggest hurdle for architects who want to get into the world of development, for example, number one, like we've just already discussed, is the kind of lack of fluency in the language of raising capital and the language of risk and the appetite for being able to risk. And the other is this kind of the mindset for it as well. And you know, particularly around taking risk and, you know, and knowing where to start of how to raise capital um, with your early projects, what did that process look like for you guys? How are you, what was, how are you, were you, were you pounding the pavement, knocking on doors, raising, raising money, or how did you kind of, you know, that, that can be a big mystery for so many. Oh, it, it, it really is. And, and, but let me demystify it a little bit. It, it really just takes gumption. I think it just takes mm -hmm. the ability to ask people, um, to invest in something that you find a worthwhile endeavor Mm -hmm. 
we have to remember that we're no one's doing you any favors. It's actually your you actually have to look at the the proposition you're providing as an opportunity for someone to make money as a, a worthwhile way of, of placing their capital and and putting it to work. So I think that you look you have to look at it in a certain way of I can ask for if I believe in the project, I know the fundamentals are strong, mm -hmm. then you should be able to raise capital. And you might have to start, like I said, small, but maybe you have to start also familiar. You have to reach out to that friends and family network that we all know yeah. exists. And you probably heard from discussions with other uh, entrepreneurs or the, the young developer who calls your uncle and calls your parents and calls your and, and it can be, it's not the, not the easiest thing to do. And mm -hmm. I think that you, we constantly have to ask ourselves, are we doing everything we can for yeah. these seed investors? And, and if the answer is yes, then you know, you're doing the right thing and that it will play out and that, um, you just have to hold fast and, and, and ideally your success begets new success and you're mm -hmm. able to leverage that, that experience and raise more capital. And maybe you're able to raise more capital from, from more traditional sources or a larger family office who's able to write a larger check. Yeah. We, we have done a thing called a syndication, which means you call a whole bunch of investors and everyone invests yet you make an offering um, or a private placement memo and, and you have to, you know, run a project with many voices, although maybe silent voices, but nonetheless, you know, many players. It, it certainly is easier to find yourself with one partner or two partners, two large partners. Mm -hmm. In in our previous lives, so to speak, when um, Kartik and I were at Tamark and Company, we we were fortunate to work with really great equity partners, big equity partners like the Carlisle groups of the world. And while those they, they, they institute a certain rigor of, of, you know, management that I think sets you up for being able to ask for capital from many different sources. But I don't think that you have to have that experience to end up there. I think that you just have to start. And I think that you have to start and leverage that to, to raise more. Yeah. What, what do you look for in a in a good investor and i find this one quite interesting because you know on the surface of it people always think oh it's someone with a load of money basically but that's not always the, just the the yeah. main the main criteria you know have you worked with more sophisticated investors who have got experience in development or developing and who are bringing another arsenal of skills to the table or has it been a real mix and 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 the other the other part of the question is you know what happens to control and how much of how much of your own money do you want to put back into the projects to kind of retain that control of doing it exactly the way that you want to be able to do it? Great question. I think like to answer that last question first, you yep. always want to be able to put as little money in a, in a deal as you can and can get away with. <laughs> but it's a balance because when you do do that, sometimes you do seed control. And with the larger investors in the room, they're, they might pound you to put more money in. And if you do, uh, if you're able to muster up, you know, five, 10% of the equity stack, you, you could find yourself with a greater degree, degree of control and the upside, the share of the promo, which is the developer's profit. But it's not always the case. I, I would, um, I think that we have had um, a variety of investors, um, both small mom and pop individuals to the more sophisticated private equity and family office investors. And right. they all offer something different and they're, they never offer, they never play the exact same role in every scenario that you might imagine. Sometimes it's actually fascinating to find the person who writes the smallest check, maybe asking you the best questions. And often that might be because that money means more to them than a very large multi-million dollar family office in which writing large checks um, is routine in matter. And I'm not saying that they don't, they don't have rigor and that, that they don't analyze your deal plan, but often it's a small investor who's asking you very good questions about different scenarios of how a deal may go that I find myself learning the most about a deal. Mm 
learning the the risk profile of the investor as much as what um, they're looking at of the return. And and I think that often actually improves um, how you look at a project. It, it also might affect how you make decisions once you're in the ground or once you're in pre-development and about mm-hmm. to be in the ground. Um, it keeps you looking out for the different potential scenarios um, once a building is, is open and stabilized. We're talking a little bit about these aspects in a vacuum. I think that not every asset is is treated the same and mm-hmm. nor is it analyzed the same and nor are they the same investor types. So I think that part of, if you're looking to raise capital, I think that you have to discern as much of what the investor is looking at and what their, what their risk profile is that they may not even be aware of to kind of marry up to the right deal. Because often we might have a lot of projects and we might have access to a lot of investors and it might take some time sorting where they might be better placed in, in different endeavors and ventures. We haven't ever launched a, a DNA fund yet. We've, mm-hmm. we've thought about it, you know, a more broad based fund in which investors allocate their capital and we allocate it over separate projects and it's not identified in any one venture or SBE. Um, we're thinking about that, but at the it's, moment, so it's, it's more like a kind of fractional ownership of across a company that's got lots of ownership in lots of different projects type of that's thing. That's right. That's right. right. We, we tend to operate at the moment with each project being its own vehicle, its own special purpose entity um, yep. and have isolated capital stacks, isolated lending structures. And our, our company will have di- varying degrees of capital investment in each of these projects. Um, and with very different investors from all different, for different aspects who might have different time horizons on, on an investment. For mm-hmm. instance, a condo project might have, uh, you know, an investor might be looking at a deal return within three to five years. Typically, that's kind of the, the clip that a, a condo investor is looking to make their return, their money back. Where um, a more stable uh, asset like an office building or others that are relying on longer cash flow might have a much longer horizon in terms of looking just for an annuity, essentially, from the investor's perspective. So it's all it's all a mix, and it's never going to be completely perfect in, in how you can find or marry up each each investor to a project. But I think we're fortunate at the stage where we've had enough success that we begin to allow it to coalesce and, and being able yeah. to identify who we might believe is best suited for a particular deal. Do you have a, a kind of a specialization in terms of the typology or the type of kind of plots that you're best at dealing with um, that allows you to kind of, you know, d- dig into a like an architectural niche, if you like? I mean, I know I'll, I'll give you an example here in the UK. Roger Zolosevich is well known for kind of taking very awkward urban gap sites in London and the kind of architectural vision is a real benefit here because they're sites that normally developers are other developers are turning away from and now that's right. too complicated or we don't we don't want to get involved in that and then they're able to use their architectural expertise to really create make something amazing yeah exactly make right. it make it work so is that, do you have that same kind of advantage where you're able to I mean because obviously you're, you guys are operating I mean in one of the fiercest real estate environments mm-hmm. on the planet so that's no it's no mean feat yeah, it, 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 yeah, New York City is a difficult market to, to function in and increasingly increasingly hard, actually, for yeah. smaller boutique firms like ourselves, where at the moment we're looking at bigger and bigger projects and the big firms are looking at smaller and smaller projects. Um, and so it is it is a, a tough market, but it's a good one to kind of develop some chops, so to speak. I think, you know, I think that it it's complicated in some ways mm-hmm. it's um you just you have to find yourself jumping in a bit and um yeah i mean i think historically we we really excelled at building higher end residential projects and they right. were i mentioned before they were mostly condo projects and while i i enjoy that i think that it affords you the ability to build really beautiful architecture um you also happen to be catering to very wealthy buyers, which is not always 
not always as fulfilling as maybe looking at different types of design and different types of projects, more, more broadly speaking. Mm -hmm. But we have found ourselves really excelling in, in developing just phenomenal residential spaces. I think innately we know the quality of, of a great residential project because it's one that we would design for ourselves. I think if you can imagine your, you yourself being the audience, the client, the buyer, and making kind of key strategic decisions throughout the development process, you tend to believe you can do quite well, if, as long as you're also on board the right team members to help represent the project. But lately we found ourselves not wanting to marry ourselves to any one particular asset type or niche. Uh, we, right. we don't want to be known just as the condo developer. And since, you know, the late, you know, the late 20, 2018, 2019, we kind of actually began to look at different types of, of projects outside of both residential, but also outside of New York City. Finding ourselves in more mixed use projects, um, looking at office buildings, looking at other types of residential buildings, and looking at doing um, a larger mixed use, um, almost a master planning development in the lower Hudson Valley that for us is is new experience coming from more of an urban developer, urban architect's perspective. And we have found ourselves really loving being able to work with a big canvas, work with a big topography mm -hmm. and a landscape and, and kind of going back to some of the training we had in our, in our school days, in our education to, to remember and recall some of the things that make great mixed use developments and master plan developments successful um, so that's been great to find ourselves kind of doing multiple types of, of projects that aren't, that are not all urban, that are not all super vertical yeah. and that aren't all residential in nature. How, how does the, the majority of your, um, developments work then? Are they build to sell or do you end up building and then renting and holding onto them for long periods of time? Or what are the kind, or is it a mixture of, of different strategies or revenue strategies from the end product it is somewhat of a mixture um we have some projects that we look to sell pretty quickly like a we're embarking on a new condominium project mm -hmm. also in birmingham uh so we would be looking to sell those units out in a relative um brief fashion so that you maintain a, a strong internal rate of return or an irr um, but sometimes we we look at projects for a more long-term cash flow holds where we might look at seven, 10, seven, 10 year plus horizons where it, it is attractive to us to kind of hold. And, and maybe it could be a function of, of strong underlying real estate. You know, I know that it's so tired and used, but location, location and location really does matter. And, and I would, I would add to that a uh, really great, architecture and a good a good project good project fundamentals also can be enduring qualities in your ability to weather different market cycles and I, we're in one now we're, we're setting up to be in a cycle now that's a bit you know not quite defined and creates a lot of things to navigate i think we all are probably pretty familiar with you know the challenges in building today with rising costs inflation and certainly with Rising supply chains, yeah. Supply chain and being able to um, rely on where you can get your materials in eighteen months or twelve months from now. All those things are challenges mm -hmm. um, that I think that you just have to be able to navigate. In a in a place like New York, where the you know land is obviously ever more scarce, how do you begin finding land? Like yeah. how does the how do, how does a project even you know just get started? There, there's so you know, many ways. Forget, forget finding money. How do you You're find right. the land? <laughs> right, that's the finding money part can actually be easier sometimes than finding land, <laughs> um, especially in New York City. You're right. I mean, it's it's so mold over. It's such a market that's so coveted from a, yeah. also from a foreign investment perspective that in recent years has really pushed up the price of land. You know, land basis has really increased with a lot of foreign investment. And I think that it's been harder to find development sites with land bases that are at a, 
a number you can actually underwrite. Um, unlike in other markets in the United States and probably elsewhere in Europe, land um, in New York is a massive component to the project costs. Where yeah. in perspective in our Birmingham projects or upstate projects, upstate New York, they're a tenth of that. So I think it's really right. fundamental. So it's a it's a testament to the fact that land costs so much in New York City that makes the cost of building so much in New York City that also creates a very expensive cost of living environment. So mm -hmm. land is hard, um, but you can find yourselves finding potential projects in just a lot of different ways. I think, as I mentioned before, you might just have a building in your neighborhood. You walk by every day and just one day you might find yourself knocking on the door or you might see a for sale sign and just talk to an owner or to a seller. Sometimes you can reach out to brokers in the community, um, getting, in, getting uh, familiar with them and, and introduce yourself to them can get you on their networks to you know, provide you sites. Mm -hmm. Often when you're being solicited a development site, um, you know, if it's being marketed, they tend to be more expensive than if they're not marketed. And not only yeah. that, you know, there's other project costs that come with the marketed site, commission, mm -hmm. et cetera, for a broker. The best projects you find are the ones that are off market, the deals that you somehow create relationships to, to discover, to find, and they, they might find you. Um, so I think part of it is, is keeping your door open in a way and, mm -hmm. and advertise the strengths of the services you may provide so that folks can call on you if they have potentially a good deal. And I would actually really encourage people to look at projects like those as a way of, you know, partnering on them to access development projects, partnering with potentially um, another owner who might have tied up the site, but even consider partnering with projects with a seller who may want to just contribute the land as an equity position that also mm -hmm. might alleviate you having to raise some additional capital that tends to be um, that that can happen in more aggressive markets like New York. It can be also something that's quite complicated to navigate because you have another big voice in a project. And to answer one of your earlier questions, I mean, how do you, you know, how do you deal with an active investor? And it's hard. It, it can be hard. I think, I think ideally you, can develop a certain rapport and trust with an investor, an LP partner, a limited partner that allows you to have the majority of control and be in the driver's seat on the decision making for the management and for um, a lot of the day to day of the project. I think there's opportunity though to kind of strike a balance with a, a prospective investor where you give them some major major decision-making rights if needed to kind of give them that fail safe and allow them to say to themselves, Hey, look, I actually could, I can trust this group to, to be the lead dog, so to speak, for lack of better words on a project, but maybe at the end of the day have that comfort that they could be more involved if they needed to. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's part of some of the ways you can structure a deal and, um, make all parties feel a bit uh, comfortable in their positions and give you the, the latitude to be the orchestrator, which is the developer and the architect. When does it make sense for you guys then to, to say not use your own in-house architectural expertise and to work with an external architect? Hmm. It's a good question. I mean, I think that we, we constantly look at, we're balancing that, right? I mean, from project to project, we look at, should we, do we need to be a design architect on a project? Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes the answer is no. I mean, I think that you can take the approach as a developer who has keen sensibilities of architecture and design to take a backseat on those and just make sure you onboard the right team who kind of carries the same ethos that you do on, in terms of design. We have to remember that like the developer and the owner still does have major control over the end outcome. I think that the for us, we found some of the, the greatest partnerships having found other key team members who bring something very strategic to a, a partnership 
and try to rely on those skills and the strengths that they bring and not bulldoze over those and use our own voice to to control. I think we've I think with time, maturity and experience have come to appreciate that. You know, there's a reason that so many other players are really good at what they do. And we ought to we ought to use their skills to the best of our ability and to their mm-hmm. ability and not and not kind of short jacket them. I think so we or straight jacket rather. We we do we do balance that analysis internally. When do we want to be the architect? Um, and I'll give you an example. We're looking at a really cool mixed use project um, that has a small hotel component, a lot of great retail, and then residential, multifamily above. And we know what we know. We we know, and I should uh, I should add um, a parking, a structured parking component, which for us in New York City, we never really have to. Do. But in other markets, you have to think of things about how to house cars. And yeah. we know just enough about how to lay out a garage to be dangerous, we like to say. And so we know that we should really rely on the expertise of consultants and other designers to help yeah. us. And so in that project in particular, we are looking for a, a really great quality architecture firm to help us manage that and be really good at designing the layouts of the units and be strategic and thoughtful about the design of the facade, all the things that mm-hmm. we would really care about and that we would normally see ourselves doing. Do, do you ever have a, a kind of, you know, a, a point where the architecture and the development internally can butt heads? And, you know, there might be like a philosophical approach of like, mm, well, actually, it's better <laughs> for the architecture if we did this long term, but like, for the business, it's better to do that. Yeah. I mean, I, I have to, uh, and how do you, and how do you resolve it? How do you resolve it? I mean, it's internal, right? I mean, it's just that conflict that can tear you apart, but I, I have to give a nod to, um, Carrie, Carrie to market on this one. Cause he used to call it actually the devil on one shoulder and the angel on the other. And I'll let <laughs> you choose which one is which, but yeah, you, you are, you, you are wearing both hats and I think it, they are competing interests, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and like normally, those would be two external competing interests in a potential team. For us, we have to be thoughtful about how we balance the two and, and how we can pu- apply them both equally on a scale and see when one matters more than the other. I don't think that one matters more than the other um, holistically. I, I think that you have to consider them almost in phases. I think that you have to constantly look at a development project, if you're designing it as well, in the different design phases, what is, are you maintaining the key ethos of a project at every interval and, and be able to price it and be able to afford it and underwrite it simultaneously as you move a project from pre-development to construction. I think that if you find yourself doing that, at least we, we tell ourselves this, if we can find ourselves justifying it all along the way, we can maintain the great strengths of what of one project might be, you know, highlighted. Um, and, and, and that process to kind of honor the architecture and the design and, and not, not dilute it so much that you're only concerned about the bottom line. Um, I know that answer feels abstract, but I think that it's just so nuanced. I think that you really truly have, truly have to look at um, the underwriting, the costs, but, and the design just constantly. It's a bit like when we design a building um, or a space, we, we don't do so just in plan or in elevation, right? Mm-hmm. When you look at designing something, you're constantly looking at plan, elevation, plan, elevation, back and forth. And not only are you doing it back and forth in terms of the plan and the elevation or the section, you're also changing scale. You're looking detailed and you zoom out. Well, that's a great analogy to how you apply the same balance to the, you know, the development and the underwriting and to the design itself at, at a macro scale. Yeah. You just have to be able to be fluid and move back and forth. There's no other way to do it, at least in my experience. Yeah. That's a very nice way. That's a very nice way of describing d- describing it, and the, the actual kind of everything really is case by case, and it has its individual nuance 
just like any other architecture projects right. where those, exactly. those considerations need to be taken on. You, you mentioned earlier about mm. understanding the risk profiles of investors. And I was wondering if you could kind of expand upon that a little bit more about what, what is a risk profile? What is it that you're, you're looking to understand? And then also if you could expand a little bit more on about, you know, your own tolerance for risk mm. and how you as a business have expanded your tolerance for risk. How do you deal with it? How do you not send yourself crazy? Well, I'll give you the, the easy answer in the last one first. You know, risk is scary. It can be scary. You want to take on, for instance, as little guarantees and recourse as you can if you mm -hmm. are borrowing money. I mean, that's, I think that's pretty clear. I think it's, people understand that too when they're getting a mortgage, for instance. But more than that, when you're doing a development project, you take risk on performance. You take risk on it not going well and being told by the bank to make them whole. That's scary risk. So I would say, however you can minimize slash mitigate or avoid that risk as much as possible, I think that's where you start. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also where a relationship with a lender actually is really important. Um, establishing rapport, trust with a lender is integral to be able to work out things when things are difficult. And it happens. I mean, I think everyone has heard the term of a workout, especially post 2008. And what does that look like? I mean, it looks like you, the, often a, a lender will, you know, take a pound of flesh out of you unless you have that relationship to kind of work through a project, to maintain the project and to convince them that you're the best entity, party, team to finish it rather than they take it from you and give it to someone else. You have to make that case. Um, so that would be the, the first place to start. And you don't always have to have um, risk or debt um, that has recourse or guarantees associated. Mm -hmm. You might be able to find um, a partnership with a contractor, for instance, to provide, provide like a completion guarantee, which is yeah. a lot easier to ask of them than other types of um, lending guarantees on the note. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you, can, you, you can find your ways of navigating that. Another, another way of doing it, um, and this kind of dips you a, a little bit into the investor side of your question, you can find a key investor who might put up a balance sheet, which just means their net worth or a portion of it as, as collateral as a way of satisfying guarantees that you may not be able to. Right. You may not have the balance sheet or you may not be comfortable in doing it. By doing that, you often end up giving them a maybe bigger slice of your pie, of your, your profit pie. But it certainly could be a way of justifying how to get started or even justifying um, how to manage your own risk and or start a project if you don't have any capital yourself. Or, and sometimes you need to develop a balance sheet of your own to be able to go out and secure the note. So yeah. those types of investors who would, I would say, be on the higher end of the risk profile scale can um, provide a great function and role to the development. Um, they tend to be individuals. They tend to be high net worth individuals that you might just be fortunate to have in your, your yeah. network. Um, uh, but it, it is certainly something that is available and that people who have created big and successful companies today have used to get started. And, and it yeah. is a place, a uh, tried and true place, so to speak. Other risk profiles for other types of investors, I mean, I mentioned um, a private equity group would be looking very differently at risk. They would probably be more comfortable putting up bigger capital and or their more corporate balance sheets and mm -hmm. certainly be looking to take a larger uh, percentage of the reward of the, of the profit. I mean, that's just how they work. That's how their business model is structured, but they provide a great role um, in capitalizing very big projects, often in very big projects like in New York and in London and certainly in other large markets. You might have several of those players in one project, in mm -hmm. one development projects. You might have many large institutional investors, all with competing interests and voices. And you very well might have them as a member of the development team too. Have They might um, allocate a certain uh, project management arm of their company to be married into a joint venture with you 
on a specific project. That often happens. Or just have to partner with another developer locally. Um, Great. And then really in between, you know, you, you find yourself all types of investors fall in, in line with the small individual to the large group. They all are looking at something a little different. And um, um, you'd be surprised that everyone, everyone still is very keen on understanding the risk of their of where they're allocating their capital and and looking at what can go wrong on yeah. on a project and and that's where actually you understand and identify the risk profile i mean that's knowing how many different ways a project can go wrong allows you to kind of understand and appreciate what they might be considering right that will be what what their kind of tolerance is going to be for exactly um you, you mentioned there as well about um you know having high net worth individuals uh -huh in your network and this is you know cultivating a high caliber network is no easy thing to do what what sorts of strategies or advice would you give to people who are you know trying to develop that kind of caliber of network where you're where you're you know you've got people from different industries from different walks of life yeah. from from different classes from different stratas right how do you, how do you, you know, what kind of advice can you give around cultivating that kind of network? You know, it's, um, it, it requires, I'm going to wear the architecture hat for a moment. It requires us to get out of our studio a little bit and, and mm -hmm. also out of our own, our, our own heads a little and go out and network and, uh, be comfortable speaking with people and, and be comfortable joining different types of organizations, both locally and maybe nationally. And I, I'm not just talking about the AIAs of the world. I'm also speaking about, you know, local club groups that might exist, Kiwanis, yeah. Rotary, those types of groups where you might find yourself being able to rub shoulders with people who are high, high net worth. And um, I would, you know, I think the, the average architect is very articulate and able to give talks and, and find themselves being able to both parlay the profession and academic worlds and getting experience and I think advertising what you do and what you like to do and getting out there and, and really advertising that um, is really important. I don't think that we naturally like to market ourselves. Um, at least I know I don't. I think that we find ourselves, we find that uncomfortable in a way because we, yeah. we have a craft that we love to do. And we want to be honest to that craft. And I think that sometimes we look at selling that as a way of demeaning the value or its worth to ourselves. But I would, I would actually challenge everyone to, to look at leveraging that and being able to put yourself out there. In that process, you meet people. And I think that um, you'd be surprised at how many architects I know who have met uh, a developer on a project that they were working on that later either were hired by that developer onboarded to their team or asked to partner on something. And so that, that's a place that often through practice and time and experience that um, we shouldn't undersell who, how many people we get to interface with in the profession. Um, and I would add to that, you know, the bank too sometimes and yeah. to customers. So it, it just takes time networking, going to events, um, I, I'm always a proponent for education. I think mm -hmm. not everyone has to go to school to get two degrees. I think that, it, you know, it's a daunting task and it's not always uh, in reach for people. But I do think that um, if you find yourself able to get a certificate in something, um, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to learn more about finance courses, you don't have to go to a grad school for another two years to achieve it and spend at least in the United States, a lot of money in order to secure that you could, you can educate yourself in different ways. And in that process, you meet people too. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. So just to conclude here, what are you hoping to accomplish or looking forward to in, uh, for the rest of the year, for the rest of 2023? Well, that's a great question. Well, um, I think immediately my mind is swirling around having a baby pretty soon, of which course. Has, has gained most of my focus. <laughs> But I, uh, I'm really optimistic about the year. I think um, I'm optimistic about some of the projects that we're, we're cooking up, um, in air quotes. And um, I think 
we just want to grow our, our team. We're nimble, but I think that we're I, I'm humbled by the team I get to work with, both internally and the partners we have. And it reminds me of just the talent that is required to build good, even simple, but good architecture. And just how often you see architecture out there that's just not great. And it's so easy to build things that are not great. But I'm, I feel so um, honored to work with a great team and excited to look forward to the projects we're, we're working on this year. Um, and certainly the one in the Hudson Valley, really being able to get that off the ground and create just a really wonderful space um, that I think is unique to the market and, and doing a lot of exciting things in both providing housing, diverse housing types, uh, really experiential driven, just creating mm -hmm. some beautiful place making and, um, and also being able to uh, play up more of the sustainability aspects of our design practice and looking forward to how the implications are on the future. Amazing. Brilliant. That's a perfect place to conclude the conversation. Evan, that's been absolutely fantastic. I've thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed Thank speaking you. with you and, and really getting under the, under the, under the, the what do you guys call it? The bonnet? The, yeah. The hood. The hood. The hood. The yeah. hood of the car, right? Um, exactly. And understanding how the different components of DNA operate together and, you know, just diving into that conversation around risk and, and what it entails. So, I, I, you know, these, these sites of conversations and where we're starting to see architecture and business fused in such a, an imaginative way, it's, you know, it's really, really exciting stuff. So thank you very much. Of course. Glad to be here. It was fun. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.